dermatologist, took over for Jim Angel about six months ago here at the University of Illinois. Um, all right, so let's start with some general information. Uh, so uh, most of the information we've been uh, talking about today has been provided as a collaboration between USDA Climate Hubs, the American Association of State Climatologists, uh, regional climate centers, both the Midwestern and the High Plains, um, NOAA, NCEI, National Weather Service, NIDAS, National Drought Mitigation Center. Um, access to this talk, uh, future climate and drought webinars and past recordings can be found at both the Midwestern Regional Climate Center and the High Plains Regional Climate Center. Uh, the next Climate Drought Outlook webinar is going to be Thursday, March 19th. That's going to be a tag team by Jeff Andreessen and BJ Bali at the Michigan State Climatologist's Office. Also want to put in a plug here for the next uh, National Weather Service Spring Hydrologic Outlook webinar, uh, which is going to be Thursday, uh, February 27th. That's the next Thursday at, at 2.30 Central. Uh, registration information is there. It's free. Uh, their webinars can be much like this one, only more focused on the hydrologic and river flooding um, uh, outlooks for the spring. Like Doug mentioned, please feel free to type in your questions as we get going, and we'll, we'll hit them up at the end. All right, so today we'll talk about uh, recent climate conditions, a little review of January, the last 30, 60, 90 days for this winter, as well as current hydrology conditions, snow, soils, and streams, some Great Lakes conditions, um, and then impacts related to all of that, ag ecosystems, flooding, coastal erosion, and some outlooks uh, for ENSO, short-term outlooks that came out today for March and, and beyond. All right, so let's start with the recent climate conditions. So uh, January was uh, pretty typical for the western half of the region. We're showing here on the left-hand side are statewide average temperature ranks. So any of the states in the darker shade of red had a much above average uh, top 10 warmest January on record. These records going back to 1895. The top right showing the same kind of map only for January precipitation rankings. So to give you an idea, it was a top 10 wettest January on record in both Illinois and Missouri. Uh, much of that precipitation coming from one a single three-day system. Uh, and it was also a top five warmest January for Wisconsin, Michigan, and Ohio. Uh, to elaborate on that, four stations in Ohio broke January high maximum temperature records uh, this last January. So uh, really a continuation of what's been a warm and wet winter, especially for that eastern half of the region. Focus more on precipitation, a little bit longer time period, 60 days. The left-hand side map is showing a departure from normal uh, for precipitation totals over the last 60 days. The right-hand side is a percent of, of normal precipitation over that same time period. So it's really a split region here where the eastern half of the region has experienced about 150 to 300 percent of normal precipitation over the last 60 days. Um, and, and although it's more mixed in the western part of the region, we do have predominantly drier conditions uh, west of, of, um, of the, the Dakotas and, and western Nebraska. Uh, areas of eastern Colorado uh, over the last 60 days are at 10 to 25 percent of normal precipitation. Um, so it has been quite a bit drier out there, although I think the main story here is the, 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 the persistent wetness in the, the upper Midwest and, and that lower Ohio Valley region. Going out to 90 days, similar maps here where this departure from normal from 90 day precipitation on the left and percent of normal on the right hand side. Uh, I think these 90 day uh, precipitation maps, especially the right one with percent normal, really emphasizes the very wet conditions stretching from, uh, stretching from the Dakotas up into the upper Midwest and again in the Ohio Valley, where some of these areas from, from central northern Minnesota all the way over to the upper peninsula of Michigan uh, have received two to 300 percent of normal. 90 day precipitation. So this winter has been very wet and a lot of that has fallen as, as very wet, high water content snow that adds to the snowpack we'll talk about a little bit later today. And so that is something that, um, you know, this winter has been warmer, especially for that eastern part of the, of the region, but also very wet. Looking at temperatures, this is 60 day, this is the, uh, temperature departures from normal over the last 60 days. Uh, so you can see definitely the, the, the eastern half of the region, the area, the colors in the yellows, the oranges, and the reds, those are uh, uh, above normal, warmer than normal conditions over the last 60 days. Definitely strongly elevated uh, temperatures uh, over the Ohio Valley region and the eastern third of, 
of this central region. Some areas in uh, northern Ohio, as well as parts of Michigan and Indiana, are looking at 60-day temperature departures of 8 to 10 degrees above normal. Um, so we'll talk about impacts related to that, but uh, but definitely a warm uh, 60 last 60 days and in, in, in general a warm winter uh, for that half of the region for sure. Uh, as we move out west, we're getting uh, smaller temperature departures. Most of the central and northern plains has been warmer than normal for this winter, although uh, to much of a lesser extent than the eastern part of the region. And as we get closer to the uh, to the Rockies, we're looking at actual uh, um, cooler than normal conditions uh, from from one to four degrees below normal. So uh, overall, uh, especially for that eastern part of the region, uh, the 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 warmer than normal conditions and uh, below normal snowfall uh, that I'll reference in a little bit. That's really added up to a very what's been a very weak winter. So I put winter here in in quotation marks because if you're in parts of Ohio, Indiana, and even Southern Illinois, it really hasn't felt like winter this whole season. What I'm showing here on this map is uh, uh, station-based um, estimates of accumulated winter season severity uh, using the Winter Season Severity Index or Aussie, which is calculated by the Midwestern Regional Climate Center. Now Aussie is a is an index. Uh, that uh, takes in daily accumulation of winter season severity points based on snowfall, snow depth, minimum, maximum temperature. And so the, the, the larger the number of points, the more severe the winter is at any given location. So it gives you an idea for to date how winter uh, severity has, uh, or how, how winter, it, how severe winter is in a given location. But then also towards the end of the season, you can begin to compare how this season, for example, compares to other sorts of historical winter seasons over a longer historical record. So you can see the stations in the, the red and the orange colors here, predominantly in the southern and eastern portions of the region, are, are noted as having mild to moderate uh, winter season severity, which is below the long-term average. And a lot of that, especially as we get into Indiana and Ohio, where pretty much every station is in the mild uh, uh, winter severity. That's mostly due to just strongly elevated temperatures, persistent warmth this winter, uh, very few cold air outbreaks, and, and well below normal snow. Just taking a plot of uh, winter season severity from the beginning of winter uh, out until May, or, uh, yeah, May 1st for, for historical records, the top left plot is from Toledo, Ohio. The bottom right is from Aberdeen, South Dakota. So Toledo, the black line here is showing what our current winter season is going back to uh, October and November of last year. The red line, by comparison, is showing the, uh, the, the same winter season severity for the 2018-2019 season. Um, and then the shaded colors represent the, the distribution of historical winter seasons. And so what you're seeing here is that Toledo, Ohio, uh, as of today, is near record low severity. So it's, it's nearly the the, the, the lowest or weakest uh, winter in Toledo, Ohio, mostly because of those elevated temperatures. By contrast, in Aberdeen, because of, of uh, a number of cold air outbreaks and, and, and uh, a decent amount of snow that they've received out there, uh, they're actually in an extreme winter season right now. And, and so, but I think the main, uh, the main uh, message from these plots and from that map that I showed previously is that most of the eastern part of the region uh, has really not experienced a very strong or, or severe winter. All right, so we can see how, that, how the climate conditions have translated to our hydrology. Well, first and foremost is snowfall. So the left map is showing accumulated snowfall as a departure from normal, going all the way back to the beginning of the winter season uh, in 2019. Uh, so areas in green in that left map are showing areas that have received above normal snowfall and areas in beige are slightly below normal snowfall. So you can see areas in Colorado, as well as the western uh, South Dakota, and up into northern Minnesota and, and Wisconsin have received anywhere between 20 and 40 inches uh, above normal as far as snowfall accumulation is concerned. Um, as far as absolute totals, that's what the right map is showing, is total accumulated snowfall in inches. Uh, just to give an idea here, in, in Delaware, Michigan, so far they've received about 240 inches of snowfall. Um, so although this looks like quite a bit of snowfall, it isn't that much uh, larger than normal. 
Um, we are seeing slightly below average snowfall, especially in the Ohio Valley region, uh, all across much of the eastern part of the Corn Belt, as well as in Kansas. Um, but overall, these departures from normal are no more than maybe 20 to, to 25 inches of above or below normal snowfall. Now, as far as, as uh, how much water uh, is available in that snow, the liquid water equivalent, um, these two maps are showing snow water equivalent as of, as of yesterday uh, over the region. The left map is showing from this year, 2020, uh, and uh, the right map is showing the same time from last year. You know, one notable thing about last year was the strong, the high snowpack, especially in the upper Midwest, that uh, uh, intensified flooding conditions once that snow began to melt in 2019. What we're seeing is that we see a similar snowpack, a similarly large snowpack across much of northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, the upper peninsula of Michigan, or, and, uh, and uh, eastern uh, north and south Dakota. Uh, however, there, there's smaller snowpack in the western Dakotas, eastern Montana, and pretty much all of the southern Midwest, including central Iowa, all the way down into the Ohio Valley. So although, again, we have in the upper Midwest uh, about the same amount of snow snowpack that we had last year, if not just a little bit more in that in the Great Lakes region, across the much of the southern Midwest where we had a uh, snowpack of, of one to four inches last year, we don't have any snow cover on the ground right now. Now, as far as how that snowpack relates to flooding risk, I'll talk about spring outlooks for flooding a little bit later, but I wanted to line these two maps up just to show the similarity in them. So on the left, what I'm showing is a snowpack as a percent of normal, a percent average across the region for, for a Huck 8 watersheds all across the region here. The, the watersheds in blues to pinks are showing well above average snowpack, anywhere from 150 to greater than 750 percent normal snowpack, like you can see that center there in eastern South Dakota. Um, as that relates to flooding, uh, what I'm showing on the right-hand side are all of the gauges in the Midwest, uh, excuse me, the Mississippi uh, River Valley, the basin, that uh, have a 50% or greater chance of flooding uh, over the next three months, according to the National Weather Service. And what you can see is that those stations along the James, the Red, as well as the Upper Mississippi River, those are the ones that align well with where this snowpack. Uh, where that, that, that liquid water will flow through once that snowpack begins to melt in the upper Midwest and the Dakotas. And so just linking those two together gives you an idea for how important that snowpack is for uh, flood risk come spring. Now, just because we have an elevated snowpack in the region of eastern South Dakota, Minnesota, and Iowa doesn't mean necessarily that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see that flood risk um, uh, actualized. However, um, uh, depending on how quickly that snow melts, um, it, that, that really just depends on, on how, how much flooding there will actually be. But those two maps do line up pretty well. So as far as further out west, you know, focusing on the headwaters of the Missouri Basin here, which I show in the generally in my red circle there on the, on the, on the map, uh, you know, Missouri Basin headwater uh, snowpack is near to above normal. So in these watersheds, what we're seeing is Snowpack is anywhere between 100 to 125 percent of normal. Um, so even out west for the Missouri River, we are seeing that that, that those headwater snowpack are slightly above normal. A focus more on on the Missouri River basin. This is showing uh, the snowpack again as a percent normal uh, above Fort Peck and then between Fort Peck and Garrison. Again, we're looking at anywhere between 100 to 110 percent of normal snowpack here. So slightly above normal. Uh, not quite where we were this time last year, but still uh, well above normal as far as snowpack uh, for the Missouri Basin. Shifting to the Platte River Basin, we're seeing actually larger departures of snowpack there. So uh, anywhere between 115 and 120% of normal snowpack in the North and South Platte Basins there. Now, if I were to do this presentation two weeks ago, we would have been right at normal. However, over the last couple of weeks, this area has received uh, quite a bit of snowfall from a number of winter storms that have elevated that snowpack to well above normal. And so, of course, uh, again, how that snow melts uh, will dictate a lot of what the, 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 the spring flood risk is going to be like in the Missouri River Basin. However, uh, it is to say that in, those, in, 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 the, in the Platte Basin, we do see well above average snowpack. 
Hey, Trent, could you go back one slide? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, I don't think we have 2018-19 uh, snow in there. So what we're comparing those uh, lines to is the, the 2011, um, that dark line on the left, we'll say that dark line going up uh, just above the current line there. We're not at the 2011 uh, level, but we're certainly above the the 30-year the average in yeah. terms of, as you mentioned, in terms of of, uh, of of snowpack. And also, like you mentioned, it is these it is it is these basins plus those a little further south that have gained quite a bit since the first of February in terms of uh, snow, uh, snowpack, water content, and all that kind of business. Uh, um, in the, I'd say in the last two or three weeks. So anyway. Um, just wanted to clarify that. There's nothing on there from last year, so we can't compare it directly from last year, but yeah. we should. That'd be a nice thing to do sometime. Anyway, yeah. on you go. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Doug. Same thing here. This line, uh, just, to, just to build on Doug's point here, this line, the dark line that's, that's shown in these uh, for the north and south Platte basins there, that's the 30-year average, 81 to 2010, not last year. Um, so that that is something we can't make that comparison. All right, so shifting from snow to soil moisture, uh, really, uh, it's a pretty simple message for soil moisture across the region. Pretty much everywhere except for eastern Colorado and western Kansas is near saturation or, or at uh, record levels of soil moisture. Uh, the, le the map on the left is from the Climate Prediction Center's model. Everywhere in dark green is showing soil moisture levels above, at or above the 99th percentile, which is essentially at saturation, if not near record levels pretty much all the way from central Montana all the way across to the Upper Peninsula and most of Michigan, uh, we see soils that are pretty much saturated. Uh, on the right-hand side is showing a similar map, only this is from NASA's sport list um, system. Uh, the, the same kind of color bar takes place, there's uh, uh, matches here where we're seeing uh, soils that are near or at saturation across eastern Montana and western North Dakota, um, a little bit less uh, um, near saturated conditions across the central uh, region, although I would say that this, this system is probably underestimating that moisture. Um, uh, but again, seeing also in the, in the southern part, the southeast part of the region, you know, draining into the Tennessee and Ohio River valleys because of a pretty persistent heavy rainfall in that region of the U.S. as well, we're seeing uh, soils near saturation all across that region as well. So very wet soils this, for, uh, for this time of the year. Just to kind of ground truth this, uh, the, these, uh, these models, what I'm showing here is a map of actual in-ground observations of soil moisture at eight inches from the Kansas mesonet. And you can see essentially the eastern third of Kansas is right or near uh, saturation. These numbers uh, reflect the percent saturation. And in some of these stations, we're seeing 97, 98, even 100% saturation, which matches pretty well with the with the estimates from the Climate Prediction Center's model. So it is likely that that uh, that these um, abundantly wet soils that are being uh, depicted here in this model are are actually there. That we we have a, a very large amount of water in the soil um, that uh, that could create problems uh, once we begin to melt that snowpack in the upper part of the region, uh, as well as we start receiving our spring rains. And, and also, Trent, you might mention that uh, it's hard to get rid of that moisture during the cold season of the year, um, especially if uh, ground freezes up, but also because there's no plant growth, and, and, and that's a normal way of transferring um, some of that water away. That's right, yeah. So, so um, if, we, if we, we don't have the transpiration, especially to, to deplete some of the moisture in the root zone, um, as well as, uh, as I'll get to outlooks, so showing a little bit cooler than normal temperatures maybe coming our way over the next few weeks. If we do get those cooler than normal temperatures, that just limits the amount of evaporation that can take place right off the soil surface. And so um, what that means is, is that a, a lot of this moisture that's here now will likely maintain there come, come, come March and e even into the, the latter part of the spring. So what this map is doing here is, is uh, again, from the NASA list system, uh, showing a comparison of soil moisture conditions from this year versus last year. So areas in green and blue are showing uh, areas that were, are wetter this year as far as total soil moisture is concerned versus last year, where areas in the orange and red colors are a little bit drier than last year. 
So we can see a lot more soil moisture in eastern Montana, all across the state of North Dakota, as well as dipping into South Dakota and Minnesota, where we're looking at uh, 20 to 30 percent more biometric water content in those soils up there. So a lot wetter up in that up in that northern part of the region. Uh, the areas in red in eastern Colorado and western Kansas are likely experiencing soil moisture deficit uh, because they are quite a bit drier than they are last year. However, one thing I want to make sure to, to make clear here is that this red area stretching from eastern Nebraska through Iowa and Illinois into Indiana, Ohio, that does show that it's drier than last year, but we are not dry in that region. Uh, soils are, are essentially still near saturation. We're just talking about the difference between near record levels of soil moisture last year and slightly below record levels this year. Uh, with that being said, this region of the, the southern and eastern part of the, of the region is slightly drier as far as the soils are concerned than we were looking at last year. Okay, so shifting to stream flow, on the left-hand side showing 14-day 14 14 average stream flow all across the, the gauges that are reporting stream flow for this time of the year. The gauges in the very, very dark blue are well above 90th percentile stream flow. Um, and th those gauges clustered in the southeast, that's a result of those heavy persistent rains that they've received over the last couple of weeks. But even north of there, coming into our region across Missouri, Indiana, and Illinois, we're seeing uh, streams that are at or above the 90th percentile, as well as up in uh, Wisconsin and Michigan. So stream flow is very high uh, for this time of the year. Uh, to give you an idea on the right-hand side, this is showing the, the 93 gauges in the Mississippi Basin that are currently at or above flood stage. Um, now, the, the kind of orangey circles there are showing gauges that are mostly in minor flooding. That's mostly along the Wabash and James Rivers. Most of the major and moderate flooding uh, are in the Tennessee, Ohio, and lower Mississippi uh, basins, and that's just because of those heavy persistent rains that have been haunting the southeast for the last couple of weeks. We do have one uh, gauge in southern Illinois that is above major flood stage. Um, that, that can be an issue, those, those rain in, in, in the southeast that drain through the Ohio and into the lower Mississippi. Uh, the, the sheer amount of rainfall that that region has gotten has, has put that area of southern Indiana, southern Illinois, and into the Boot Hill, Missouri, into flood stage. That could be an issue uh, as we move forward, especially as some of that snow uh, north of there begins to melt. Uh, and we see, uh, you know, uh, that persistent wet soils uh, that allow for a lot of the runoff. So um, talking to one uh, resident of southern Illinois the other day, they, they feel like they've start, had an early start to what they call the flood season there. All right, so let's do a flip here to drought. Not much drought across the eastern half of the region. Uh, on the, across the western half, there was some improvement from last month uh, in western Colorado just showing the most recent U.S. drought monitor map here that was just produced today uh, based off of conditions on February 18th. Um, the not much expansion of drought over the last month, a little bit of, of expansion into western Kansas, but not really much uh, concern as far as drought uh, is concerned there in Kansas. There is a, overall a low risk of drought expansion moving into spring. Um, U.S. drought outlooks are showing that this area here in eastern Colorado and western Kansas has a very low likelihood of expanding uh, come spring and summer. Although, again, conditions, my text got cut off there, but conditions can change quite a bit more rapidly once we get into our warm season. But right now, the, the risk of drought, especially outside of eastern Colorado, is, is, is quite minimal. All right, so let's shift to the Great Lakes. So uh, as I mentioned before with those maps of temperature, the, great, uh, the temperature, air temperature around the Great Lakes has been well above average for most of the winter, and Great Lakes temperatures have followed suit. So they've remained above normal in response to warm winters, and ice cover along the Great Lakes is greatly diminished versus the last few years. So total Great Lakes ice cover is about 15%. The vast majority of that is in Lake Superior. Um, compare that to about 66% of total Great Lakes surface covered by ice this time last year and about 42% in 2018. So it's greatly diminished ice cover. Now that does allow, uh, the, the, the lack of ice cover does allow for more evaporation off the lakes. However, it also kind of uh, removes the buffer for lakeshore damage so that when we, when we don't have that ice cover around lakeshores, it allows for the winter storms to whip up pretty large waves, uh, which can create quite a bit of damage. We'll talk about a little bit um, in impacts coming up. 
Uh, but that is to say that this is, is one of the, the lowest uh, uh, Great Lakes ice cover uh, seasons that we've had in, in, in quite a while because of those persistently warm temperatures. As far as Great Lakes levels are concerned, every single one of the lakes has well above average levels. So I'll show these plots here for each of the lake basins. Uh, this is showing uh, monthly Great Lakes levels. This one from Lake Superior. The red line are from our observations from 2018 all the way to the present. The dashed blue line showing the long-term average. These black bars here in the bottom and the top are showing uh, record levels for every single month over the historical period. And then the uh, the kind of hashing here showing our forecast moving into the rest of 2020. So uh, for Lake Superior, the levels, the 2019 levels did break records for five consecutive months from May to October. We did see uh, a, a pretty typical uh, decline in lake uh, levels in Lake Superior moving into January and February of this year. However, uh, it is likely that uh, the forecasts are showing that we will be near record levels uh, from now all the way until July on, on Lake Superior, if not breaking those levels and very close to record levels. For the Michigan-Huron Basin, it's actually uh, a little bit of a worse outlook. So, um, you know, typically we have this pretty seasonal pattern of Great Lakes levels that's shown by that blue line where we go up. Uh, the highest levels are in the, the peak of the summer in response to runoff from spring and the lowest levels in the wintertime. Uh, there were some records broken uh, uh, last year in the Michigan-Huron Basin. However, really we saw, we, we didn't see that, uh, that decline over the wintertime that we typically see. And so uh, Michigan-Huron levels were three to four inches above the, the all-time record in January, set in 1987. And you can see here from these forecasts uh, moving into February, March, all the way into July, that even the mean of those forecasts is well above each of the records, uh, the monthly records going into July. So it is likely that Michigan-Huron water levels will break uh, multiple monthly records moving into uh, the rest of 2020. And we'll talk about impacts related to that in a little bit, but, um, but that is, is a pretty significant uh, to, to show that the, the mean of the forecasts remain well above the, the, the all-time records for every single month going all the way to July. Similar things for Lake St. Clair. Uh, we see the, the projections are uh, that, that kind of greenish line there is well above the long-term records. Uh, most, a lot of those records were set, especially in the warm season, were set last year, 2019. Um, so it is likely, again, that, that uh, Lake St. Clair water levels will uh, remain well above average going into the, the rest of this year, but also may, may uh, set new monthly records um, in spring and summer. Lake Erie, the, the story is pretty much the same. Uh, broke, uh, uh, got near January record levels. February will likely break levels, uh, record levels in, in Lake Erie. And we continue to see that, that upward trend where forecasts are straddling uh, those all-time records. So still well, well above average. Uh, Lake Ontario is really the only one where the forecasts for the rest of, of, of this uh, spring and summer don't approach the, uh, the, the all-time record levels. However, Lake Ontario is, is still right now well above average and is forecast to remain there throughout the rest of this uh, spring and summer seasons. Okay, so let's start getting into some impacts. So focusing on ag and, and ecosystem impacts right now. So first and foremost is the continual challenges of harvesting 2019 corn, mostly corn acres in North Dakota. Uh, the NAS estimates uh, showed 51% of North Dakota corn acres unharvested as of January 27th. Of course, of course the uh, uh, cold air outbreaks and, and, and pretty persistent snowpack, especially in eastern North Dakota, has made things pretty challenging up there. Haven't seen a whole lot of reports about overall expectations of grain quality. It's unlikely that, the, that, that, that uh, all of the 51% of, of the unharvested acres are, will be um, unusable, but uh, the quality still remains a concern um, once uh, once farmers are able to get out um, and 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 finish up the harvest from 2019. Wet soils are really a concern across most of the region. It is likely that that we'll see delays related to ag come spring. Um, a lot depends on on how the, how the snowpack evolves and, and melts over the next several weeks, as well as how much rain we do receive in the next few months. However, even if it is drier than normal for spring. 
uh, we still have a lot of water to deal with in the soils, um, and, and that will become an issue for most of the region as we start thinking about planting in the spring. Uh, something we uh, received impact for, uh, report from, uh, from North Dakota, uh, all of this persistent wetness increases the risk of wheat midge uh, that's caused by the persistently wet conditions. Um, the one kind of uh, silver lining is that, uh, especially in the eastern part of the region, uh, persistently warm temperatures have kept uh, soils uh, pretty well unfrozen throughout much of the winter. That has been able to drain surface moisture a little bit with not too much impact on flooding. However, uh, as I've shown with the maps with soil moisture, we still have a lot of water in the soils. And so I still have a lot of way to go for, for um, you know, unfrozen or uh, um, you know, temporarily unfrozen soils to mitigate spring flooding. On the flip side, uh, dry conditions that have been persisting for a number of months now in eastern Colorado, we have heard of some stress to winter wheat and some livestock have to be supplemented uh, because of that as well. One uh, sort of impact that uh, has just started to become apparent is uh, early spring leaf out across the southeast U.S. This map is showing the spring leaf index anomaly, which is an indicator to the start of spring based on the first leaf formation on lilac and honeysuckle. Uh, and, and what you're seeing there are areas in the dark red are areas that we, start, we started to see the, the first leaf out anywhere between 10 and 20 days earlier than normal. Uh, and so to give an example, that, that leaf out has been 18 days earlier in Nashville, Tennessee than what we normally see or the long-term average. Now, there's no direct correlation necessarily between what's going on in the southeast and what's going on in our region. However, given the persistently warm temperatures in the eastern half of the region, especially Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, um, it is likely we will see early spring green up uh, in those regions. Uh, and so that does become a concern because we, we still are not, uh, we're still quite a ways away from our median last spring freeze date across that region. Just to give an example, showing an image here of some uh, winter wheat in southern Ohio breaking dormancy, uh, courtesy of Aaron Wilson there, that photo. Uh, also some reports from the St. Louis Metro East area is that some fruit trees, peach and apple buds are beginning to color up. Uh, no buds breaking yet reported around, around that area of southern Illinois, but that is still a concern given the fact that the map on the bottom left there is showing that even in the southern part, in the southeast part of our region, we're still a good month to six weeks away from our median last 28 degree freeze, let alone a late freeze. And so that, 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 that is a concern and will continue to be a concern, especially if we have uh, uh, you know, a few warm air outbreaks in, in March. Okay, focusing on Great Lakes coastal impacts, some of these photos are, are pretty incredible. Um, so the, the elevated Great Lakes levels that I alluded to earlier have increased the impact on infrastructure just by themselves, but have also increased the impact of winter storms, especially the, the damage done by large waves because of those elevated lake levels, uh, as well as erosion along the lakeshore. Um, in Michigan, there's reports and photos you can see here of houses sliding into lakes, flooded sewer and septic systems, uh, entire roads that need to be moved inland because of the, the increased lake levels. Michigan Department of Transportation estimated $100 million in road damage so far this year from those, uh, from those elevated lake levels and winter storms. Uh, away from Michigan, we've had multiple cities, including Milwaukee and Chicago, as well as the states in Wisconsin and Illinois have called for federal emergency declaration. Uh, the city of Chicago estimated uh, damages in excess of $25 million just from a, a handful of January storms alone. Um, and given the forecasts of, of uh, persistent Great Lakes, high Great Lakes levels, it's likely that we'll continue to see some pretty significant damage in the Great Lakes region because of that. Other impacts we've seen, uh, there have been a few uh, fatalities reported in Kentucky and Illinois due to flooding along the Tennessee and Ohio rivers because of a lot of that precipitation that the southeast region has gotten. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers estimated uh, recently that levee damage due to 2019 flooding was in excess of one to two billion dollars. That's billion with a B. Um, also included with the Army Corps, they continue to release water at Gavin's Point to try to prepare the Missouri River Basin for spring flooding. The amount of water that the Army Corps is, is, has released, uh, the, the 35,000 CFS, is over twice of what they normally do at this time of the year. And so they're really trying to prepare that Missouri River Basin 
um, uh, and that levee system for, um, for, for spring rain and for melting of that snowpack and those persistent wet soils that cause quite a bit of runoff. Uh, Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, Iowa governor signed an agreement to combat flooding in the Missouri Basin. So along with the federal declarations in Illinois and Wisconsin, we're seeing some policy uh, related impacts because of flooding last year and this year. Uh, also some impacts for, uh, to transportation, a ground blizzard in North Dakota, Minnesota closed roads, including a, a, a large stretch of I-29 between South Dakota and the, and the border uh, a few weeks ago, several accidents reported there. Ice jams caused some pretty significant flooding along Highway 275 in, uh, in Nebraska, and there were some uh, pretty heroic rescues from flooded cabins that were being washed away because of that. Also, uh, uh, warm temperatures, uh, warm air outbreaks there in South Dakota has led to some, some thin lake ice. So uh, we've had some uh, reports of vehicles going through the ice, like this poor chap here in his brand new Chevy that went through the ice a couple weeks ago um, up there. All right, so uh, finally, let's focus on some outlooks, what we expect. So focus first on the seven-day precipitation forecast, the QPF forecast. So it looks like a wet week forecasted for most of the region. Uh, Seven-day totals approaching two inches around Kansas City, a little bit less as you move out from that bullseye. Uh, heavy rainfall is, is forecast to continue in the middle Mississippi and lower Ohio and Tennessee valleys. Uh, not really much impact there on the northwest part of the of the region, but uh, for parts of southern Indiana, Illinois, western Kentucky, especially those downstream of where the Tennessee meets the Ohio rivers, that could worsen already uh, um, existing flooding conditions. So that's something to watch out for in that region as well. Longer term, the 8 to 14 day outlooks that were just released today from the Climate Prediction Center. Uh, the temperature outlook on the left, precipitation on the right, that big blue blob that's sitting over the southeast U.S. and encompasses most of our area, that's showing elevated odds of colder than normal conditions or below normal temperatures across most of the area. Um, and on the precipitation side, those browns and beiges are showing elevated odds of drier than normal conditions pretty much everywhere. Um, so it is likely that once we get past the next couple days of precipitation for the region, it's likely that the, the period between February 27th and March 4th, the end of this month, beginning of the next month, will be uh, colder than normal and, uh, and, and hopefully drier than normal as well. Outlooks for the month of March showing something similar, especially for the southern and eastern parts of the region. So the temperature outlooks on the left are showing, again, those blue areas are uh, uh, elevated odds of below normal temperatures uh, across much of the southern half of the region. And for precipitation, uh, we're showing equal chance of above, below, or normal precipitation for the western part of the region. But this uh, beige area here that's centered over Illinois and Iowa, that's showing uh, elevated odds of below normal precipitation uh, for March. So it is likely that the, that 8 to 14 day outlook of uh, drier than normal conditions, um, these, these outlooks are showing that that could persist for, for the month of March. So that if that does uh, come to fruition, that could help to uh, uh, mitigate some of those, those wet soil impacts. However, it would be nice to, to see those drier than normal conditions coupled with warmer than normal conditions to help with some evaporation. And then uh, lastly, some seasonal outlooks. So this is for uh, meteorological spring, March, April, May. Again, with temperatures showing elevated odds of colder than normal conditions for spring in the high plains, warmer than normal across the Great Lakes in the southeast region of the, or the southeast part of the region. Um, as far as precipitation, still seeing uh, wetter than normal or, or elevated odds of wetter than normal conditions pretty much everywhere. The bullseyes over the Ohio Valley region and then up into um, the, 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 near the headwaters of the Missouri. Uh, that's where the, the, the odds of wetter than normal spring are the highest. However, that green encompasses pretty much the entire region. So we're still seeing uh, the, the, the highest odds for wetter than normal conditions uh, in spring, March, April, and May. And then shifting a month, April, May, June, we don't really see much change in those patterns either. Again, uh, slightly stronger odds for warmer than normal conditions in the eastern part of the region. Um, and we do see that that, uh, that, that green blob of, of wetter than normal conditions, the elevated odds for that shifting slightly to the east, but still encompassing a large chunk of our region. So again, this spring is likely, uh, the, the, the odds have, have been pretty, pretty consistent. Uh, the map's been pretty consistent since October that, we, that we're expecting a wetter than normal spring um, you know, over the next couple of months.
So uh, focused on ENSO, don't need to take a whole lot of time for this because uh, um, we've been in neutral phase in ENSO uh, since I started my job, I think, last six months ago. And a neutral phase is forecasted to persist all the way through summer. Um, now, you know, predictability based on ENSO for precipitation and temperature minimizes over the summer anyway, but especially during neutral phase, so there's not really a whole lot of predictability we pull from that right now. Uh, as far as outlooks from the Great Lakes, I alluded to this a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to read all through these, but it's essentially that uh, Superior, the Michigan-Huron Basin, St. Clair, and Erie are likely to be at, if not above, record uh, levels all the way through July. Lake Ontario is forecast to be below record high levels, but still well above average over the next six months. So the impacts, again, we've been seeing across the Great Lakes because of those elevated levels, uh, that's likely to con to uh, continue uh, throughout the majority of this year. All right, so getting to some flood outlooks, I'm gonna break this down by basin, starting with the upper Mississippi basin here. Um, what I'm showing on the right-hand side are all of the gauges in the upper Mississippi basin with a 50% chance or greater of flooding between now and April. So 197 gauges across the upper Mississippi River Basin with that 50% or greater chance of flooding over the next three months. 111 of those uh, gauges have a greater than 90% chance of flooding over the next three months. So overall, there's uh, uh, um, above normal risk of widespread minor flooding, even on some of the smaller rivers in the upper Mississippi Basin, and a much above normal risk of major flooding along the Mississippi River. And again, you can see that here, the, those, those gauges with a greater than 90% chance of flooding in the next three months are right along that Mississippi corridor there. Uh, also, long duration flooding, something that we saw in 2019, is a possibility in the Mississippi River, especially if soils maintain high soil moisture through the spring. Um, the snow water equivalent, lots of that liquid water in that snowpack in the northern half of the region is well above normal. Uh, the rate of snow melt, so how quickly we warm up come spring, as well as any additional snowfall and any heavy rain we, we receive in that, in that region of the upper Mississippi all influence flooding severity and how quickly that, uh, that snow will melt. But again, just to come back to this point, um, widespread high risk of flooding come the next three months in the upper Mississippi River Basin. Shifting to the Missouri, there's still an above normal uh, risk of widespread flooding across the Missouri and a much above normal risk of major flooding on the Missouri River Basin, or uh, excuse me, on the Missouri River itself. Uh, high water content snow in the eastern Dakotas, as well as above average runoff pretty much since last fall. Um, uh, lead to this outlook of, of uh, significant risk of flooding across the, Miss or the Missouri River Basin. Uh, 94 gauges across the Missouri with a 50% or greater chance of flooding between February or between now and April. 36 of those gauges with a 90% uh, chance or greater of flooding over the next three months. So still um, not quite as widespread risk as the upper Mississippi, but still a significant risk for flooding in the next three, three months. Lastly, the Ohio, you know, it's been slightly drier than last year across the Ohio basin. However, what hasn't helped is all of the rain that the southeast uh, corner of the U.S. has received over the last couple weeks that have led to flooding in southern Illinois and Indiana. Um, get an early start to what I said that residents say of the flood season. Overall, the Ohio River's got 43 gauges with 50% or greater chance of flooding uh, between now and April, 23 of those gauges with a 90% or greater chance of flooding. So uh, although the, the outlook isn't quite as, as, uh, as dim as it is for Mississippi and Missouri, there's still an elevated risk of flooding over the next three months in the Ohio River. Okay, so Trent, ending with the summary here. Yeah. Trent, yeah, Trent, real quick. Um, go back one slide. So all of these maps that he just showed you of the Ohio, Upper Mississippi, uh, Red River of the North and uh, Missouri Basin. These are all going to get updated, and and when when we're done with this, um, I'm going to have Trent go back to the URL to sign up if you want for the hydrologic outlook um, next week uh, for external partners, which you all are um, uh, webinar. So j just this will all be updated. Not to, not to say it's going to change that much, but uh, it'll be updated next week. Next, I think it is Thursday. So anyway, go ahead, sorry. No, you're good. Okay, so summary. Um, so overall, it's wet, no surprise to anybody. Uh, it's wetter than normal conditions in January and February across the region. Streams remain above normal, uh, if not in flood stage. 
And I think the biggest thing here for hydrology and the flood risk is, is just the, the sheer amount of water that's in the soil right now that uh, will likely not be diminished very much or significantly between now and, and uh, uh, you know, the middle part of March. Um, and it is likely to elevate the risk of flooding uh, once we begin to melt that snow and get our spring rains. Uh, we've had a warm winter so far, especially across the eastern part of the region. That's helped to uh, um, uh, lead or led to some uh, vegetation breaking dormancy. Again, we're even in the very southern and eastern corners of the region, we're still a good month away from our median last spring freeze date. So that could continue to be an issue, especially if we get a number of, of a warm air uh, uh, outbreaks come, uh, come March and April. Across the Great Lakes, Reduced ice cover, very high conditions. That uh, uh, Michigan Huron Basin could break every month's record this year as far as levels are concerned. And already, just two months into this year, we've seen uh, billion, or excuse me, millions of dollars of, of damage because of that. So that, that is an issue moving forward. As far as snowpack is concerned, well above normal snowpack in the upper Midwest, near conditions what we saw last year, especially in the upper peninsula of Michigan, across Minnesota and Wisconsin. Below normal uh, in the western Dakotas and high plains. However, what is there, uh, especially in South Dakota and Nebraska, is a high water content snowpack. And so once that begins to melt, there'll be a lot of water released from that. Heavy rain in the southeast led to an early start to flooding season in Kentucky and southern Illinois. That could be exacerbated, uh, especially because of the wet soils and, uh, and, and the next seven days outlook showing a pretty consistent uh, widespread rain in that region as well. As far as the short-term outlook is concerned, we're looking at colder than normal and drier than normal uh, all across the region. Uh, the longer-term outlooks for March and the seasons beyond, uh, wetter than normal pretty much across the entire region for, for the spring. That's March, April, May, and April, May, and June. And so, uh, again, as far as our hydrologic conditions are concerned, combined with our spring outlooks, there is a, a strongly elevated risk of spring flooding in all of our basins, Mississippi, Missouri, the, the Red of the North, and, and the Ohio River basins. Um, so with that, I just want to uh, provide information for partners that have contributed information, um, including uh, NOAA's NCEI, uh, the U.S. Drought Portal, Climate Portal, the State Climatologists, and the Regional Climate Centers, the Midwestern and, and High Plains. Uh, with that, I want to thank you for listening, and, and I'm happy with uh, with Doug to to help with any questions. Yeah, I think um, go back to slide two. <laughs> yeah. And I'll just right. reiterate uh, that uh, where it says register for the National Weather Service Spring uh, Hydrologic Outlook webinar, uh, that might be something you want to get on next. Uh, yeah, next Thursday at 2:30 Central Time. Um, we're going to leave that up on the screen for a minute for for anybody who wants to uh, to get that. Um, this is a, this is what we do in the spring. This is what Weather Service NOAA does in the spring in terms of updating this typical time of year that uh, snow melts and we have issues with flooding. It's not the only time of year we have it, obviously, but uh, it's one of the uh, one of the one of the key seasons for that. I do believe it's March. Hope I get this right. March 11th. Um, or somewhere thereabout, there'll be an official um, hydrologic outlook as well, again, uh, from sort of the NOAA level. So uh, we'll make sure people know about that when when that gets advertised as well. Um, now to the questions. Uh, first of all, wait a minute. Thank you, Trent. That was excellent. You did a great job. Uh, you did a lot, covered a lot of different things. So I'm going to go through uh, a number of these <clears throat> questions that we have. Uh, hopefully those uh, who have asked them will, will be sticking on for that. Um, one of the questions from uh, Brian uh, Fuchs was, is there a graphic that shows the difference between the 2018-19 season and the 2019-20 uh, season in terms of snow? And I think you showed something along yeah. those lines, right? It, it was a departure from the normal, not a comparison with 2018-2019. Oh, so, okay, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I don't I, I, I guess we could manufacture such a thing. I'm not sure it exists or not, but that's a good thing that we might show in the future. Um, yeah, absolutely. Obviously, that's pretty easy. Yeah, I, you, you can look at that. Uh, I, I, I think, generally speaking, um, we have less overall coverage of significant snow water equivalent across definitely the Missouri Basin. 
uh, this year, although there is significant amounts in North and South Dakota, um, less so in the, much less so in Nebraska and places west. We'll just say western. High yeah. Contact. Real quick, Doug. Uh, what I'm showing on the screen oh, right go. now. The, yeah. yeah. So this is this isn't snow. Um, this is snow water equivalent from the snowpack from on yep. the left 2020 and on the right the same time for last year. Yep. Yep. That's good. Um, then the next question is, oh, uh, yeah, uh, Bryce, you asked uh, when we get to the forecast maps, you were wondering why the March precipitation map for the Midwest uh, was for below normal. And I think a lot of that, a lot of times when you look at the, if you want to go to that map, by the way, uh, the March forecast or outlook, um, a lot of times we're looking, our best forecast is for the first half of the month. So. Uh, because our models are, whoops, our models do relatively well through uh, th through two to three or four weeks and stuff, and then the last half of the month is a little less uh, a little less predictable. But um, with the cold air coming down, which I, I think Trent showed, uh, there's a propensity to have less precipitation and drier conditions, and that's that's the that's why we're hedging towards the drier than normal conditions across the Midwest because there's more cold air. And thus drier air and um, less less precipitation. I think that's why. Um, uh, let's see here. Okay, could you speak more on the snowpack soil moisture spring flooding comparisons between 19 and 20? Um, what I've been telling folks is uh, and and chime in Trent and Dennis Dennis is on I think on the line um, somewhere wait a minute Dennis you must be on the regular not a not a panelist hold on a second but I, told you. I don't know can you hear me Doug oh I can hear you Odd, oddly enough Yay. yeah you're, okay. you're stuck in there um, so so you know the reason that we're sort of poised and we're, we're, we're uh, still preaching uh, the, the potential for major flooding this year is really, uh, if you will, antecedent soil moisture for the most part. Snow is a contributor. Uh, we don't have the depth of, of frozen soils like we did last year. Uh, every day that goes by that we don't have rain um, or snow <laughs> um, is a, a move in the right direction in terms of that, uh, what we saw last year in terms of the bomb cyclone and no one's predicting that at the moment, by the way. Um, so the condition, the antecedent conditions in terms of soil moisture are worse in many places, and um, uh, snow conditions variable, I would say. Uh, the mountains are getting a little more snow than they had last year at this time. Um, what else are we talking about here? So all those are contributors to uh, potential flooding, right? Um, any, anything else, Dennis or, or Trent, you want to say about last year compared to this year and how, if you will, ripe we are for uh, flooding? I'd say you hit it pretty well. It's, it's obviously soil moisture. Soil moisture up in the northern plains is somewhat maybe worse than it was last year. Um, lots of several things still to happen to produce major flooding, but there is definite risk of flooding given how primed we are. At this yeah. point. So we're we're even worried about if we, even if we get average precipitation, we're worried about that. It really it, it all comes down, and, and many years are like this. It really comes down to how quickly we warm up, um, how much above normal or even near normal precipitation we get, and how that precipitation falls. If it falls in in lighter amounts over time, that's not nearly as bad as a three to five inch massive area, okay, um, which can cause major problems for a lot of folks. So that's pretty unpredictable out, you know, beyond a week or two, uh, those kind of huge heavy rainfall. We do have hazard maps that show that sometimes, uh, but beyond two weeks, it's really tough uh, to say which way it's going to go. Um, let's see. Thoughts? Okay, uh, Dennis, this is, this is more or less for you. Thoughts on prevent planted, planting? chances this year in other words not planting uh, also on uh, what set what part of the regions are probably most prone 
to prevent planting and maybe even explain what prevent planting is in, in a sentence or two. Oh boy, and I get to cover this all in two minutes. Okay. Yep. Um, places where there's the biggest concern for prevent plants this year, I would say Dakota's part of Minnesota, um, you know, maybe up into Wisconsin and Michigan where we've been the wettest and there's the biggest carryover at this point. Uh, Iowa and other parts of the Corn Belt have had maybe not quite as much of a situation. Uh, the question about prevent plant, what it is, it is part of crop insurance that um, if, if conditions are not appropriate for you to get into a field, uh, it allows you to get a settlement on your crop insurance. You don't put anything in the ground, you get a payment, you walk away, you just have to make sure, make sure weeds are kept in, in control and things like that. Um, we probably, there was a huge amount of it last year because of the widespread wetness and ongoing issues. Um, there were several factors. There might have been more acres that went to prevent plant last year, uh, given some decision making and things that went on. So uh, my biggest concern right now, especially are places like uh, North Dakota, we're still sitting with half of the corn sitting in North Dakota. So we have acres that, that are at real risk up there. Um, you know, the area from Kansas, Iowa, main part of the Corn Belt, not quite as bad. So it depends much more on what upcoming conditions look like there. Yep. Okay. Uh, along those same lines, planting delays in the spring due to delayed harvest carryover from uh, well, I think you just mentioned it, due, due to delayed harvest carryover from 2019. Uh, I think those kind of fit into what you were just talking about, but planting delays generally and then uh, into those areas that have not even harvested yet. Right. So, uh, so, there, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's definite risk all across the Corn Belt of planting delays. Um, how serious uh, still is is to be determined. The, the point you made earlier about every day we don't get additional snow or rain is a step in the right direction, I agree. Um, let me see if I can give you something else here. Um, uh, wow, oh, <laughs> this is a tough one. Why was the weather so severe? Or in, in this case, I wouldn't say severe from a point of, from a point of view of, of precipitation in 2019 and will 2020 be expected to be similar? I'll answer that from a trend point of view. Um, across the Midwest and, uh, and to some degree the Missouri Basin. Um, first of all, the Midwest, the nine states, basically from Minnesota down to Missouri over to Kentucky up to Michigan, those nine states in there, um, have never seen a wetter year. Um, and in fact, they've never seen a wetter year by far. All right. So, you know, just off the cuff, I would say the likelihood of that happening again is very, very low. To get close to that record or exceed it for sure. Um, but even if it is above normal, which is a whole bunch of other years, by the way, um, we're going to have severe problems. So the trend overall has been to be, as an, on an annual basis, wetter than uh, what we've had in the past. That is the trend. Doesn't mean we can't go into drought, but the trend line is definitely on an up, upward uh, slope, if you will. Um, that's pretty obvious from the data that we collect. Um, and then, um, any 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 information on frost depths and historical averages uh, compared to that? That's another kind of tough question. The second part is, but frost depths this year are nothing like they were last year at this time and into March. Uh, don't ex there will be some cold air coming down, but it's probably too late to do the really deep and hard concrete uh, uh, um, uh, coverage that we had last year at, in, in March when, if you will, the bomb cyclone hit and all the other, when all heck broke loose. Uh, compared to historical averages, I have no idea, Dennis or Trent. Mm. Any idea? Uh, really, no, I don't have any, any kind of assessment on that. Certainly, the trend towards warmer winters has probably kept the frost depth uh, more, more shallow than it used to be historically. But there is an interplay between uh, how wet are your soils, how much snow cover do you have on your soil. Those all impact as to what your frost depth is. So it's really 
quite variable from year to year and hard to talk too much about trends. All right. Yeah. And, and, and Trent, since, since you haven't been answering any questions, I'm going to give you the uh, toughest one of all. So, okay. <laughs> okay. And last question, last question. The world climate maps continue to show higher than normal temperatures almost everywhere except the northern plains. Why is that? And will that change anytime soon? <laughs> no. Yeah, good stuff. All right. Yeah, so, um, well, a couple a couple of reasons why uh, the, the, the right circulation patterns that established last year, especially, that stayed in place for so long that made for our, our pretty persistent wetness also brought cool air into the region. So when Doug talks about how wet the year was, especially in spring, it was also much cooler than normal uh, across much of the region. Um, and, and that was just the right dynamics at the right time while most of the other, most of the, the most other places on earth were, were dealing with elevated to much, you know, above normal to much above normal temperatures. At the same time, there's also a feedback process where uh, areas that are wet, especially in the summertime when we don't have a lot of, uh, you know, large scale circulation features uh, bringing us a lot of different changes in the air. Uh, areas that are wet, especially when the Midwest and Central Plains and, and Northern Plains are wet, that usually means that temperatures are depressed a little bit because there's a lot of evaporation. Uh, we don't have a lot of uh, sensible heating. We don't have a lot of elevation of those temperatures. And, and so there's a feedback there too, where we just had so much water in the ground and on the ground coming into summer that, uh, and even in fall, that, that those temperatures just stayed you know, below their long-term average. Yep. Did that that's good. Yep. Answer? Go ahead. Yeah, no, that's great. The other other only factoid I would add to that is that um, it's it's mostly the high temperature of the day that's depressed is is definitely depressed the most in those cases where you have a lot of moisture or a lot of water sitting around. The minimum temperature of the day often is maybe even slightly elevated simply because it doesn't get as cool. Uh, because again, you have a lot of moisture around sort of balancing out. So you don't have those swings in temperature that you do, um, let's say in, in a drier, drier climate. Okay. And I think that is the final question. Uh, if I missed one or you want some more, if you have other questions, please uh, feel free to email any of us. Um, we appreciate you being on board and taking all this extra time out of your day. Um, and we'll be back, like we said, in March on the 19th and hear from our, our, our partners out of Michigan. We're going to do the same uh, basic talk for the whole north central part of the U.S. Anyway, thank you, Trent. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you all. Um, talk to you next month. Bye-bye. <laughs>